Good evening. Oh, so first job I've managed to do right. I've switched the microphone on. That's always a good start, isn't it? It's great to be here. Thank you so much for turning out tonight. There's so many other things you could be doing, but um, please don't leave early. And I'm delighted I've got a microphone because um, one thing I've learned in this job is you have to learn to project your voice quite well, but never ever ask, can you hear me at the back? Because I did a few months ago and a gentleman thought himself a bit of a comedian. He called out, he said, I can hear you, but I'm happy to swap with someone who can't. <laughs> so I thought, learn a lesson there, never ask that question again. Uh, anyway, so um, really pleased to be here this evening, as I said. And I've been asked by the organisers to talk to you for about three hours. And Oh no, that's not right, is it? No. Uh, just to give a short talk, a bit about my role. We'll talk a little bit about policing and then I'm going to open it up to the floor because I'm sure you will all have lots of questions. As you've heard, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Hurrah! So you're not going to get bored to death by looking at slides behind me, which is really good because I much prefer to talk to people. It's a much nicer old-fashioned thing to do uh, rather than asking you to read something on a screen behind me. So, um, as you've heard, I'm Katie Bourne and I'm your Police and Crime Commissioner, not just for East Sussex, for the whole of Sussex. So there are 1.7 million people living in Sussex today and I have the privilege of representing them all and being their voice in policing. So, the Police and Crime Commissioner. The role has been around now for 10 years. Well, I'm in my 11th year actually in it. And the reason it was brought in was it, um, there, was a, there was a whole change in policing and the way policing is governed in this country back in 2012. There was a piece of legislation that came into being that created my role and there were many of us up and down the country in each of the counties where you have a police force. So you are represented there by a police and crime commissioner. Now my role, I always say, represented probably the biggest reform to policing that this country has seen since policing began. And the reason, you know, police over the years have had lots of changes. They've had changes to their pay, their pensions, their structures, their uniforms, goodness knows, all sorts of stuff. But my role is definitely the biggest change. And as I said, my, my job primarily is to be the voice of the public in policing. Now, before I came along, there was a group of people, 20 people, called the Police Authority. And they were made up mostly of local councillors, from, taken from the three top-tier authorities. So you'd have councillors from East Sussex County Council, West Sussex County Council and Brighton and Hove Unitary. And then there were a few others who were independent members. So some of those had experience in the third sector, some might be magistrates and so on. And that group of 20 people, their name was, quite snappy title, the Sussex Police Authority. And their job was pretty much to do what I do, although over the years they've added a few bits extra into my role, which I'll, I'll go on to in a second. But their role was to set the budget. Uh, they had responsibility for the budget in policing. Uh, they made decisions around the council tax, as I do, on whether it, you know, how much you pay in your council tax for policing, the bit we call the police precept. Um, and they appointed the chief constable, which I can do as well. But as I said, the reason that the decision was made to do away with the police authorities was because the one area where they really failed over the years was to connect with the public. So if members of the public had an issue in policing and they wanted to, um, you know, they wanted to make a complaint or they, uh, they needed somebody to, to go to, uh, they were meant to go to the police authority. But of course, very, very few people knew that the authority actually existed. Now, of course, and I know this for a fact because the year before I came into office, the BBC ran a poll nationally and they asked people, do you know about the police authority? And less than 8% of the people that they polled knew that there was an authority there of people to represent them. A year later, after we'd all been in office for about a year, they went back and re-ran that poll. Oh, hello. That worked well, didn't it? That battery didn't last very long. I know we've got an energy crisis, but this is ridiculous. Thank you. Perfect. So, a year in, they re-ran the poll, and 62% of the public who were asked 
said they knew that there was a police and crime commissioner there. Now, granted, they might not have known my name, but they knew I existed. And in fact, I've been introduced as Katie Boyle. Um, I've been in, I've, it's gone again. We're doing well tonight, aren't we? Hang on, let's try holding it down. There you go. I've, I've stopped. Oh, no, it doesn't like it. I think it's your batteries. I can, I can talk a bit louder if it helps. No? All right, we'll do this. Okay. I, I'm only on half volume here. There we go. Well done, that man. Oh, brilliant. I love technology when it works. Um, yes, yeah, so as I said, I've been introduced as um, Katie Price, even. Oh. oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the similarity is, personally, but there you go. Um, but my particular favourite was several years ago, I was at a primary school in Sussex, and this little lad had to introduce me to the assembled guests. And he got up on the stage and he said, um, boys and girls, mummies and daddies, I'd like to introduce Katie Bourne. And I thought, great, he got the name right. Thank heavens for that. And then he stopped because he couldn't remember my title. And you know that moment where you've been rehearsing with your child or your grandchild all night? And you're just waiting. And at that precise moment, you think, oh, they're going to let me down. He looked around the room. And there was his mum at the back of the hall. And she was mouthing the words, police and crime commissioner. And the little light bulb went on in his head. And he went, ah. Oh, she is the police prime minister. <laughs> and I thought that is definitely the best title I've ever been given in my life. So let's go back to 2012. The legislation comes in and uh, the legislation does away with the old police authority. Out go 20 people. In comes one directly elected person. Now, the question that I've been asked many, many times is why is your role political? Doesn't that politicise the police? Well, the reason the role is political is because I make one crucial decision on your behalf, and that is to do with how much you pay in your council tax for policing. Now, you cannot have somebody like me making decisions on how much you pay in your council tax unless you have a right to vote them out of office if you don't like those decisions. You can't have taxation without proper representation, and that is why the role is political. Interestingly, once I'm in the role, I actually don't behave very politically. I have to represent everybody, whether they voted for me or not. And invariably, a lot of the people who come across my uh, desk tend to be quite vulnerable and in very difficult positions. And very often, not only don't vote for me, they probably never voted in their lives. So actually, the role itself is one for, of public service. You're there to do the best you can on behalf of the people in Sussex. So what is my job? I write the plan. The police and crime plan is the strategic document that says to people in, that says to the chief constable, these are the priorities that matter to people living in Sussex. So the police and crime plan has to represent those priorities that matter to all of us. Now, unsurprisingly, in 10 years of doing this job, the one thing that people say to me all the time, more than anything, is, I want more bobbies on the beat. I want to see visible policing in my community. And so that is what I have tried to do since I came into office. So I've been out to the public many, many times, like tonight, ask them, is that still your key priority? I saw loads of nods happening there. It really resonates with people. And there's only two ways that I can get funding into policing. One is from the government. So about 60% of our budget comes from government finance um, and we're, a, we're in a conversation with them at the moment because they apply something to, called a fair funding formula to what they give me for policing. It's not terribly fair for all of us in Sussex um, but it's some sort of formula and we've asked them to review that which they have actually started to do so that, that piece of work's being kicked off because actually it's not fair for us and, and if we had some of the funding that some of my more northern colleagues get we'd have a lot more availability to put even more officers on the beat every year in Sussex. The other place I get funding is through our pockets, locally, through council tax. And so I've gone out to the public every year and said, if you give me more money, I promise I will give you more officers. And unsurprisingly, 
The majority of the public that I've asked have said yes, provided, we'll give you more money, provided you give us those officers. And that's exactly what I've done. So over the last four years, I promised the public that you would have, through your local council tax, an extra 250 officers. And that, at the end of this month, will be delivered. So the end of this financial year, 31st of March, standing at where I am today, you will have those. Now, two years ago, the government also said they're going to give us more officers nationally. And you've heard about the 20,000. Um, and we've benefited from that as well in Sussex. So at the end of this financial year, the end of this month, compared to where we were 10 years ago, we will have more police officers physically on the beat in Sussex than we had 10 years ago when I came into office. So that's not a bad achievement because that was a promise that I made to the public, to all of you, and I've been able to deliver on. Now, is it as many as we would like? Of course not. Could we do a lot more with more? Yes. And that's part of the reason why I've got this ongoing conversation with my colleagues and government about how we're funded from the general taxation pot. So I set the strategic direction for policing the county and those priorities must reflect what 1.7 million people in Sussex tell me matters to them in policing. I then have to hold the chief constable to account for delivering on those priorities. Now, when I came into office, there was no blueprint on how to do this job. You know, when you go to work normally, you get a new job. Well, actually, looking out there, you, you're probably really enjoying your retirement now, aren't you? I always remember my, my eldest son when he turned 21 saying, um, my mum asked him, what do you want to do when you grow up? He said, I want to retire. <laughs> <laughs> she was having so much fun, he thought that was the way to go. But um, I digress. Anyway, so I hold the chief constable to account. So if you go into a new job, normally you'll be teamed up with somebody and they'll say, right, Katie, you go along with Bob, he'll show you the ropes. Or if you go into a council, you'll have a tra whole training package on what to do. With this job, because it was so new, literally back in 2012, in that November, when I got elected, there was no manual on how to do this. Literally no manual. So I had the staff from the old police authority had tupid across. So they were now part of my team working with me. And that was it, really. It was down to me then to decide how to do the job. But the legislation was quite clear. You set the plan, you write the police and crime plan that reflects the priorities of the public. Do that. So that was the first 100 days. That's what we had to do. You hold the chief constable to account for delivery of policing. What did that mean? So I thought, well, actually, I want to be as transparent as I can be. I'd like to show the public what I'm doing. But I thought about this long and hard and thought, could you imagine if over a million people suddenly said to me one day, well, we'd really like to come to your accountability meeting with the chief constable. I wouldn't be able to find a room big enough, not even in a hotel as lovely as this one. Um, so I thought, right, we're going to put these online. We're going to webcast them. Now, of course, nowadays, we all understand about Zoom meetings or Teams meetings and virtual meetings and FaceTiming and all the rest of it. But 10, 11 years ago, that was still quite a new concept. Um, and it wasn't actually being done. And I remember at the time when I said to the Chief Constable, let's webcast these meetings and let's do them every month. Um, there was a certain amount of nervousness there because it was so very new. But for me, I thought, well, what a brilliant way for the police to be able to actually explain why they do what they do why they make the decisions they make on our behalf. So they can do that online and you and I can go in and watch it. And also for me, great way for me to show the public that I'm actually holding the chief to account, which after all is part of my duty under the legislation. So that's what we do. So every month I have a performance and accountability meeting, snappy little title, but we've put, we use the anagram PAM, we have a PAM, once a month with the Chief Constable and her seniors, you'll see me ask those sort of questions that the public want to be asked. And I do all sorts of topics. I can do national stuff, or I can make it really personal and really local. If I've had particular, um, maybe uh, several members of the public have written in perhaps about a spate of burglaries and they're not happy with the response, I can really zoom in and talk to the chief directly about those and ask, you know, what are you doing about it? What's the plan? What's the response? Or 
Why isn't there a response? Why hasn't there been what the public want? And that's how we do it every month. Now, some of my colleagues around the country, they'll do it on a quarterly basis. And some of them still do do it behind closed doors as well. But for me, I like to do everything, most things, not everything, in the open. There are a few personal things one should always do behind a closed door. But, but as far as the job goes, I think be as open as you can be with people. And hopefully, throughout the course of this hour, you'll see that actually with me, I'm going to try and be as honest with you as I can be. I'm not into pulling wool over people's eyes because people aren't stupid. They are not stupid, particularly when they're retired. <laughs> they've, lived, they've lived a whole life. They, they can kind of sniff out stuff when you're trying to make things up or be, be what you can't be. So I hold the Chief Constable to account on a monthly basis at the performance meetings. And then I set the budget. I decide on your council tax going up or down. Now, normally that decision would be taken in council with all the members um, by full council. For me, with this job, it's just done by me. And that's why, really, my role is a political one in as much as you vote for it or you don't. So if you don't like the decisions that I make during my term of office, you can vote for somebody else at the ballot box and completely change the direction of policing our county. Obviously, I don't want you to because I quite like the job, but at least you've got that opportunity. Under the old system, you couldn't do it. So whilst the police authority that used to exist, those 20 people, the majority of them were local councillors, they weren't directly elected to the authority. They were elected by their division, by maybe three or 4,000 people. But they weren't directly elected by the whole of the county to be their voice in policing, which is what this role is. And then ultimately, I appoint... And if necessary, I have the power to dismiss the Chief Constable. And I often get asked that question, have you ever fallen out with the Chief? No, is the answer. Because those of you that have had your own businesses and been in, been in the commercial world will know that if you're going to work well in any organisation, you've got to have a professional relationship. A Chief Constable has done a minimum of 25 years in the role. And I remember when I first came into office back in 2012, the then Chief Constable at the time, um, he'd, he'd got 30 years of policing under his belt. Uh, why would I want to start throwing my weight around and pretending to know his job better than him? No, my job is to ask the questions that we want asked, to get under the bonnet, to, to have a good old route around, and to probe and to challenge and to be a critical friend as well. And I think in Sussex, this role's worked really well because I've always had that respect for the profession that they represent and vice versa. They understand, Sussex Police, understand about governance. You know, we have a right as members of the public to ask those questions because they have powers over us that are quite far reaching. Uh, if anybody, and I don't want anybody to admit to it, but if anybody's ever been arrested, keep it to yourself. <laughs> We're amongst friends, I know, but, um, but if you have, they have powers to you know, detain you, put you in a cell for a period of time. They have the power to search you if they want to. It, that's a huge power over another human being. And you probably, if you've had children, I mean, that was the last time we had those powers as parents. But as an adult to an adult, that is an enormous power. And that is why in this country, our model of policing is policing by consent. We give permission to our police force to police us. Now, in order for us to give them that permission and that permission of consent, we need to trust them. We need to have confidence in them. And part of the confidence that we have in policing is that visibility piece. And that is why it is so important that we continue to try and get those police officers out there where we can see them in our communities as often as we can. And it's a debate I've had with senior officers over the years. I've had senior officers say to me, well, you know, Katie, I can put, you know, a PCSO or a police constable on in a particular street. And while they're walking up and down that street and everyone's seeing them in that street, there's a burglary happening in a parallel street that they're not going to prevent. That's kind of missing the point. The point is that all the people that have seen them in that street will feel much more confident. 
they're more likely to tell friends and family and then when the police need that vital bit of information or intelligence they're more likely to give it to them as well and support them when they need them and that is the model of consent that we have and that's why it's so precious and at this particular moment in time with policing in our country it is at a very difficult point because policing has been our confidence as members of the public in policing has been hugely undermined by what's happened recently and you know I'm sure I'll have some questions from you later on about that but it's just really to give you that um, that confidence and that reassurance that we, in our current Chief Constable, um, we have someone who is really, really determined that she will root out officers who do not meet the standards that she expects within her police force. Uh, you'll read in the papers, I think just today it was announced that another officer on Friday got marched out for gross misconduct. Actually, I want to see that and so does she. We want to see more of that because it shows that, that what's at the moment is um, is actually having a positive effect. We do not want, and other officers don't want those officers amongst them either. So let's move on to a bit of policing and a bit of crime. Things are changing, aren't they? Do you know the fastest growing crime type at the moment in this country? Fraud online. If I'd said 10 or 11 years ago, and I used to ask this question of the public a lot, I'd say to everybody, right, everyone in the room who's had a weird email in the last few weeks or years that's asked you to click on a link and open it, can you put your hand up? And invariably, about 90% of the room would put their hand up. And I'd say then to them, keep your hand in the air if you reported it to the police, and everybody would bring their hands down. And that, to me, was a real benchmark. I thought, wow, look at this crime that's happening, and nobody's reporting it to the police. So we knew it was an issue 10 or 11 years ago. And Sussex and Surrey Police were the first force in the country to set up a joint cyber, cyber crime, it's been a long day, cyber crime unit, um, because we could see that these were issues. Again, our local council tax paid for that, so that's why that particular raising in the precept went to pay for this. But over time, that cybercrime has increased and we are losing, as a country, billions every year due to online fraud. On average, our over 75s in this county lose about £23,000 each, on average. That's a huge amount of money. Um, so we have a, a, something called Operation Signature in Sussex which is Sussex Police's response to over 75-year-olds who are victims of this type of fraud. Um, unsurprisingly, I did a big survey many years ago. I set up something called the Elders Commission, where we had 30 members of the public taken from all over the county who were between the ages of 65 and 85. And they all volunteered, and we interviewed them, and we chose the 30. And they went out to all their communities, their organisations, their associations and clubs, and they had those conversations with people of their own age. And the reason I did this was I'd set up, a year earlier, I'd set up a youth commission with young people. And I was really proud of what they'd done and the reports that they'd come back with and some of the topics they were talking about. And I remember saying to my mum at the time, who was in her 80s, isn't this brilliant about the youth? Look at the stuff that they're telling me and what matters to them in policing. And she looked at me, as only your mother can, and she said, well, that's all very well, dear, but what about me? And I thought, this isn't about you. And she said, well, actually, yes, it is. She said, what about people like me who have as much right to have a say in policing, but you're not asking us what we think? And, and I went away and thought long and hard about this. And I thought, you know, she's absolutely right. So I set up an elders' commission. And... When they produced their report, what they said was really fascinating. One thing in particular stood out. The police at the time wanted me to put more money and budget into antisocial behaviour and stuff that was happening on the streets. But 17%, so nearly a fifth of our over 75s that they'd spoken to, said they were more terrified of when the phone rang in their front room. They were more worried about people phoning them and trying to take money from them and put pressure on them than they were actually about being accosted in the street when they'd gone out their front door. So it made us really think about, actually, how is the policing response 
being delivered to this age group. And unsurprisingly, when I asked the Elders Commission, I said, look, can you go and ask others? Uh, I knew what the answer would be, but we needed to test it. Actually, we asked them, if you want a police response, would you be happy if you've been a victim of fraud and lost a load of money? Would you be happy if the police sent you an email telling you what you needed to do to protect yourself? Unsurprisingly, the answer came back, no, I don't want an email sent to me. I've just been a victim of online fraud. Would you be happy with a telephone call from a police officer? No. What did you want? I want a police officer to come to my house and sit down with me and tell me face to face how I can improve what's happened to me, how I can put things right, how I can protect myself. So that's now what we do in Sussex. We have something called Operation Signature. And all our over 75s, because that's the sort of the age that we've determined you're a bit more vulnerable. Not everybody is, but majority tend to be at that age. If they've lost money, we get a list sent to us from Action Fraud every month. Um, Sussex Police will go through it and they will contact anybody over the age of 75 and they will say to them, we know you've been a victim of fraud. Um, we'd like to pay you a visit, sit down with you and make sure A, you're okay and B, you know how to protect yourself going forwards. It's been massively popular. It is a bit intensive, resource intensive, but it's what people in Sussex wanted. So we continue to do that in Sussex. And that's just an example of really listening to what the public want, what we want in our policing. So a quick roundup of the role. Hopefully you, you're a bit wiser tonight on what a police and crime commissioner does, even if you don't remember that my surname really isn't Price. Um, but also, uh, why policing matters. And then about two years in, government gave us more money. The Ministry of Justice decided that they wanted police and crime commissioners to be responsible for all victims of crime in our county as well. So they give me about £2 million a year, just short of, to spend on victims of crime in Sussex. So, you know, if you're a victim of any crime, you will get contacted in the first instance by victim support because they have our major contract to deliver service. 70% of our victims don't need any help. They're fine. They've got friends, they've got family, they've got a good support network around them. They don't take that help up. About 30% though do, and they tend to be victims of much more complex crimes. So crimes like domestic abuse, like serious sexual offence, rape, stalking, and so on. And those victims need specialist help. And so it's my job to ensure that there are organisations in our county who are properly funded to deliver that help to all of us. And that, for me, I think, where out of everything I do, is the bit that really gets me out of bed in the morning, being able to actually help those victims. And I'll tell you a very brief story before I open it up to questions. Several years ago, I had a, a woman in my office who was in her early 30s. And she had a, uh, an older, she had a daughter, I think she was about 10 or 11 at the time. And about three years earlier, she discovered that her then boyfriend was sexually assaulting her daughter, raping her. So she went to the police, did everything that a parent should do, absolutely spot on. Um, and they had to go to court. And she was able to access our young victim and witness service. Now, it's the only one of its kind in the country running at the moment that we fund in Sussex. It's over and above the usual help that you get if you're a victim or a witness of crime and you have to go to court to give evidence. As an adult or as a child, there is a national service that's paid for by government. But in this county, if you're a child, you get extra help. So we have a whole group, a suite of people who are specially trained and they go and they work not only with that child, if that child's been a victim, but also with the family as well. And this young woman had come into my office to say to me, because I was at the point where I was thinking, it's quite an expensive service, this. Should I still be funding it? Or should we put the money into something else? And she came in to tell me what it had meant to her. And I'll never forget it. She sat there and held my hands. And she said to me, not only did we get that guy convicted, and he's in prison, she said, but my daughter now has gone back to school, because the poor love had, you know, she'd come away from school for a long period of time. She said, my daughter's back in school. She's just started her GCSEs. My young son, who it had affected as well, 
he'd been playing up and he'd become slightly violent. She said, he's calmed down immensely. He's back in school and behaving himself. And she said, and for me, she said, I've got a job. Because she lost her job. Uh, she couldn't cope. I mean, who could as a parent knowing that anyway? Um, but she'd lost her job and everything had just fallen about her life. She said, I'm back in work. I love my new job. And things are actually, she said, it'll never be right. But she said, it's so much better than it was three years ago. She said, whatever you do, don't stop funding that service. So for me, to be in a job like this, where you can really make a difference to someone's lives, is a huge privilege. And that's why I always say I've got the best job around, without a doubt. So, so I'm going to give it a